Welcome to Camp and Trailer Australia TV and here we are at the start of another journey. We're in beautiful Dargo in the Victorian High Plains. We're up here, we're going to go across the top and across into Swifts Creek, but we're going to take our illustrious editor, Emma. She's on her way up here with a brand spanking new mountain trail camper trailer as well. We're also reintroducing to long-time readers of Camper Trailer Australia the Tambo Camper. We're taking it out for a bit of a run at the moment. We're going to use it this weekend, find out what it needs, how good it is in the bush, take it back, do a whole project on it, have some great adventures with it over the next 12 to 18 months, and then eventually it's going to be a giveaway for one of our readers. So here we go, the Dargo Pub. And I've got to say, you can't come past the Dargo Pub without going and having a pot. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Air pressures in tyres, obviously most important, whether on the road or in the bush. These are down. Lucky I checked actually, because uh, you know, low air pressure on tyres in the bush can really give you a lot of trouble. Low air pressure obviously on sand spreads the load out, easy to get across, but when we're going across dirt roads, it'll wipe your tyres out in no time. So make sure you've got the right pressure. Imagine, imagine finding a carload of mermaids out the back of here, eh? Look at that. <laughs> Love it, look at you. Well done. It's a lovely day. Isn't it great? We're going to see some awesome views. So Absolutely. Let's go. We're cooking brekkie, aren't we? We are indeed. And what are we cooking, Em? We're cooking French toast, crunchy French toast, um, with bacon and maple syrup. And maple syrup. Yep, it's a Canadian style breakfast Ooh. for the Australian bush. Oh, sounds good to me. So, we've got some little bit of egg and milk in here. Excuse my fingers. Oh, you need, like no, you need your um, corn flakes? Oh, the corn flakes. That's what I'm saying about your Silly production line. Silly me, my production <laughs> line nearly died. <laughs> All right. And we have the crushed crunchy nuts, soaked bread. You've got to be careful when you do this, you don't soak it too long so the bread falls apart. We wouldn't want that. We've all done that before, haven't we? Everyone's been there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a nice scattering of crunchy nut. It's yep. going to be smattering. Smattering. Scattering. Scattering. And scattering. in, I reckon we can get two in there. Let's crank that bad boy up a bit. Look what's happening there. The old sizzle front. Here I have my crunchy nut cornflake French toast with my Canadian bacon on top. But the final touch is a little bit of this. Oh yeah. <laughs> and you know what? With the leftovers, we have crunchy nut omelette in bacon fat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does everybody want to try a bit? <laughs> Well, Em, we've had a good night, we've had a good brekkie. It's time to pack this little puppy up and go and hit a few mountain trails. Let's, what do you reckon? Let's do it. Well, here we are climbing back up a hill, but just back before this, we've, uh, we've had some wonderful little windy stretches. Not all that dramatic in, in uh, four-wheel drive conditions, but uh, we've done a couple of nice little river crossings and uh, a little bit challenging, and they've taken the mountain trail across river crossings with the uh, with the Mitsubishi Majero and uh, seen just what a four-wheel drive can do with a decent camper trail behind it. 
so far no fatalities, all's well. And uh, we're climbing up a hill now. We're, we're going to be climbing up to about 4,000 feet. So at the end of the day, we're probably going to climb through the clouds here. Long way up, first gear in high, and expect to be that way for quite a long time to go. Well, they set me the challenge and the challenge was, was to put a decent off-road vehicle on the road or off the road for under $15,000. And so far, I think I've come up with it. We've got a uh, 96 model Land Rover Discovery and uh, it's got a diesel. It's been fully rebuilt with all the gear. We've put a heap of accessories on it. It came with quite a few as well. And at this stage, it only owes us 12 grand. It's gonna be a project. We're gonna have some fun and see how far we can get for under 15 grand. The sun's coming out. Hello, that thing. Oh, there, we come from there. This is the bear. Meet me little brother. No, I'm your little and I'm, brother. And I'm the, uh, I'm, I'm the um, he's the brains as well as the brawn this in is, the family. This is Dave the Brave. He lives in the mountains and has done for a while. And you can tell, can't you? No, he's guided us all the way through the tracks and, uh, and shown us some campsites and uh, done a great job. He and his dog. So far so good, we've had a great night last night. Yesterday we came from uh, Dargo, had a great night staying at Dargo, and then uh, came right up across the top of the ridge line. We're basically looking at the Gippsland Lakes drainage basin on one side and the Murray River drainage basin on the other. So we come right all through that ridge. Today we've had a great little night just down by the Wentworth River and just beautiful little campsite, had a swim in the creek, it was just great. And today it's pack up time, so uh, we're heading back now across the mountains to Swifts Creek. It's a beautiful day, great day for travelling. It's been a lot of fun. Just amazing scenery up here. It's just beautiful. What a beautiful morning too. It's uh, what are we? Early March, mid March. The sun's finally come out. Um, and uh, we're running up this ridge line and it is the Great Divide ridge line basically. So we've got Gippsland Lakes drainage basin on the right of us. We're climbing up the big hill in third gear low. And uh, we've uh, got the Murray River basin to the left of us. So it's just an amazing area. Very, very steep. You wouldn't want to drop off the side here, that's for sure. Um, my morning's been great. Sun's out today, which is lovely. It's nice and crisp. It feels like autumn, which is great because it is autumn. Uh, we're now going to check out Mad Lucy's house, which is a little bit scary. Um, Bear will tell you the story of Mad Lucy. Stay tuned. Spooky. Well, there's a mattress on the floor. I sort of don't really want to go in. You go. <laughs> I'll go. Oh wow. Hessian. Hessian walls. Mm. Well, there's soap. Just <laughs> check it out though. Just matches on the floor. 
Right, well this is uh, the old Strowbridge's property, Strowbridge. And um, the story goes, this is uh, the story of Mad Lucy. And um, what happened was uh, Lucy and her parents were living up in the, uh, further up the hill in the gold mine area and uh, in the late 1800s I think it was. Um, and uh, the old man got crook basically and uh, tried to walk to Bensdale, <laughs> never made it. Uh, left the two women uh, with a, you know, obviously Lucy's mother with a young daughter. That was probably about the 1930s when they came down here. Um, built the uh, the shack and the shack behind it. The mother lived in the uh, in the front, and Lucy lived in the shack out the back, which is actually an earthen floor. It's all falling down, obviously now it's been chained off, so as you can't get in there. But uh, it was an earthen floor out the back, and Lucy lived there. The mother died somewhere around the 70s and uh, 1970s and uh, left Lucy here by herself and of course up here we're in snow country as well up in the high plains so the, the one thing about this she's got running water the other necessity is, is to keep warm so Lucy's life was spent walking around the bush the whole time with a tomahawk and she had a system of ring barking trees so you just chomp 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 I used to come up here hunting and uh, and you'd just hear where Lucy was and so she actually had a whole route planned out right through around the uh, around the mountains here and little dugouts for when she was caught out in the snow as well. There was little uh, spots all around the place where she'd take shelter. But basically her whole life was spent chopping firewood. She used to actually leave a, um, a note in a baby carriage out on the... Um, out on the road out the front here and I think it was the local uh, the local priest used to pick up the uh, the carriage and she'd order everything out of your uh, your mail order catalogues so anything that she needed and that was basically her only contact with the outside world was actually getting stuff and if there was any letters or anything like that they had to t come up the copper had to come up and take the shotgun off her because a couple of four-wheel drivers were get starting to get around it was starting to get a bit popular up, up here so uh, they had to take the shotgun off her so she didn't have a shotgun when she died. Unfortunately, she didn't get to die alone. In there is a, um, a uh, earthen floor and all there was basically was a table and a fire. She used to just walk around at night, not much else to do, do some reading and uh, a well-worn track around the table. Unfortunately, got, she got sick in her late 70s, I believe, and, um, and ended up with breast cancer. They picked her up and took her into Romeo Hospital, and she died in hospital. So you can imagine just the spin-out for, for this woman who's been up here, never seen people basically all her life, let alone a traffic light or a, uh, a hospital, for that matter. Imagine going in and, and laying in hospital uh, on your deathbed. So that would have been a spin-out. I think we would have been better off to leave it here myself. Um, anyhow, this is basically one of the last sort of relic type. Um, you can see the architecture with the old bits of the rainwater tank and the kerosene tins. There's a lot of um, tin work done around the sides of it, which is actually they brought up the kerosene tins, some to run bloody um, um, engines off to drive the gold mining equipment. Um, and they built the bloody kerosene tins out flat and they used them on the roofs. Mm. Mm. You know, and it just goes on and on and on. But it's amazing how many. Um, the country was a lot more open. There's a major water race that takes off in this creek, which you're 25 metres away from up there, and it feeds away for miles and it follows the contour around, which meant there was a lot more people living in the area because there was, um, when you've got a water race feeding water, as soon as you've got water, you can build a house and have your kids. Hence, there was a school up here and all that sort of stuff. And, but um, it's like a lot of places, like, you know, over Dargo and Grant, all those places you just come from, you just did and buried, eh? So, bro, they tell me that um, Lucy's um, buried up in the Omeo Cemetery in an unmarked grave, is that right? Yeah, we went to try and find it once. Yeah, nothing there. It's marked on this little registration form, but I, I must go back to prove that up, but I believe it to be unmarked. But they just need maybe a little plaque here, because he's a bit of a local legend. Mm. Best neighbour I ever had because she kept out of my hair and I kept out of her hair. So if there's any stonemasons watching this, Lucy could do with a gravestone. That's if it's fair <laughs> dinkum. We couldn't find it.
as we said before, we've uh, we've come out of the uh, fairly much the natural bush settings and all the rest of it into more the farm and and uh, tre uh, tree felled areas as well. So we're actually coming down the Brookville uh, Gap to um, into the valley of Swifts Creek now, and uh, so we're only about 20 minutes from town. The uncivilized part of the trip's pretty much over now. We're in a grazing area, but the vistas are still here. I mean, it's just beautiful country. Beautiful day. I tell you, this is what it's all about, isn't it? No doubt about it.